was praying about what God wanted to bring this week, and, and I really kind of was having a hard time. I was, everything I got was pretty much a reiteration of what we'd already talked about. And I didn't want to beat the proverbial dead horse. And so I was like, what does it really look like? What's next? What should I be doing? And, and so yesterday we were on our way up to, uh, to Rick and Shirley Kyle's uh, ranch. We were visiting them and, and uh, we got, Lori and I were talking and, and I had really been thinking about talking about what our calling is and what it really means. And so I came up with this, and I called it the Moses excuse. So this morning, we're going to be talking about the Moses excuse. We're going to be looking at quite a bit of scripture, because I think that it relates to our lives pretty well. So the excuses of Moses, everyone knows the story of the burning bush, right? Moses is around 80 years old at this time. He had had an interesting life from being a baby in a basket, going into Pharaoh's household, coming out of Pharaoh's household and, and having to flee because of, of murder. And so he really had no family. His Egyptian family didn't like him anymore. His Israelite family thought he was probably pretty stuck up because he was a, he was a palace kid. And so he had no one. He had no one to call his own. And, and so now he, he ran away, and he's out in the, the desert. He, he met his, his, his wife and, and then family, and, and we know the story. He's out with, the, with the, the flock on a mountainside, and all of a sudden we got a burning bush that's not being consumed, and we've got a question on our hands. And we get to see an extensive amount of excuses brought forth by Moses. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, but this is the interesting part. So th- we have these Moses excuses, but I believe a lot of times his calling and our calling are very similar in some ways. And so we're going to real quick, right out of the gate, I want to open up uh, to Mark 16, 15, and 16. Mark 16, 15, through 16. So grab that one, put a finger in it, and then we're going to do 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. How many people at age 80 would be interested in trying to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? No way. No way. Hey, you guys, I'm already on Social Security. I'm pulling my retirement. I'm pretty happy on my mountain. I'm going to take care of my sheep, take care of my family, and I'm golden. I'm not a young kid anymore. If you'd asked me 30 years ago, I'd have been all over it, but today, not really. Obviously, they lived longer in those days, but his average age would have still been close to 80, 90, around 100. It wasn't like back in Genesis where we're seeing 900-year-old individuals. So he was already at the end of his life. He was at his prime age and past. And, and so when he was talking about this, I understand why he did not like what was coming his way. Let me tell you right now, do not mix your last week's sermon notes with your this week's sermon notes. You get an interesting sermon. And so we're going to start out by Mark 16, 15 through 16. And it says this. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Obviously, that has nothing to do with Moses, but it has to do with what God's calling us to do. Moses had a call to deliver his people. We had a call to deliver people as well. But our call is for people's souls, not people's existence. Everyone have 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10? We're going to go there next. And it says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession. I love that. God's special possession. Did you know you are a special possession to the Almighty God? That, let that sink in. Let that actually permeate you a little bit. You are God's special possession. You know what that means? You have no ability to say, I'm not worthy or I'm not good enough. Because you're God's special possession. And you know what? I don't know about you, but I know something about my God. And my God doesn't make mistakes, and he doesn't make trash. He makes special possessions. You may sit there and go, you don't know my past, you don't know my present, you don't know what I'm going through, you don't know what I'm dealing with. I don't have to because you're still God's special possession. And this is it. The person out on the street, the guy that's getting out of that jail down the street this week, he's God's special possession, and we're called to be a part of his life, her life. 
that family's life, the family with nothing, we're called to be a part of them because they are God's special possession. So we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Then it says this, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. God, I thank you this morning for the opportunity to open your word. God, I thank you for the opportunity to meet together as a family. And God, I pray as we start looking a little bit at the excuses of Moses, that it might open our eyes a little bit to our lives. God, I thank you so much for meeting us in worship. God, I thank you for this family. And as we launch into 2016, I know we keep talking about it, God, but I feel that you've got great things this year. I sense that. I see that. And so, God, I pray that I could be a part of that. And I pray that this church could be a part of that. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we have, I believe that it is God's will, and I know this because it's scriptural, that none will perish. Would you agree? None should perish. How many people have ever found something that's so amazing you just got to tell people about it? It's like, I, I, I did it. Recently, what is it? It's the Instapot. How many people know what an Instapot is? We got a couple in the back. I had no clue what an Instapot was before this week, what it is. It's a pressure cooker, guys. That's all it is. But it's a funky pressure cooker you don't have to stick in your oven. It's just like a crock pot that's a pressure cooker. Go look it up. But anyways, we now have blogs about it, and we've got pages about it. The point is they found the coolest new thing that's been around for 75 years to cook food in. But we're, we found it again. And this time you have a cord on it. Exactly. It's easier and simpler. It's electric. Yeah, you plug it into the wall, and it's got digital, and, and you can cook, your, you can cook your, your split pea and ham soup in five seconds or something like that. I don't know. But the point is this. When you find something really cool, you've got to tell people about it, right? That's life. Well, let me say something right now. We've got the most amazing thing in all of history, and we know about it. But how often do we tell people about it? I can tell you about an Instapot, and no offense, no one's going to judge me. No one's going to, I mean, maybe some guys out at the plant might think I'm a little weird. But the point is this, you can talk about an Instapot, and people will listen, and, and no one's going to get offended. But when we start talking about it, their eternity, people start getting offended. People start getting a little on edge. We're going to talk a little bit about Moses and his excuses and what, how it applies to us. So for that, um, we're going to open up to Exodus 3, starting in verse 1. And we're going to spend some time there. Exodus 3, verse 1, the title in my Bible is Moses in the Burning Bush. Why this came to my mind is recently I've read about this story, because I don't know about you, but I really would like a burning bush experience in my life. Wouldn't you agree? You have these questions, God, what do you want me to do with my life? I'll take the, I'll take the burning bush. I like that. I want, I want it to be like, boom, a bush, and God's talking. And it's like, I'm all over it. Perfect. I'm in. I'll quit my job. I'll do whatever it takes because I had a burning bush in my backyard that didn't get consumed, and the Almighty God was talking out of it. Wouldn't that be easy? But instead, we sit here and go, God, I want you to give me wisdom. I want you to show me my future. I want you to show me my, my path. And then we, we stop and there's crickets because that's life. But there's also a time, and we had an individual, there was a, uh, we had a family this week. We went over to their house and we were talking, and, and this individual and I were talking, and we were talking about God's plans in our lives. And a lot of times, God opens doors and says, do you trust me? Here's an open door. I'll close it if it's not my will, but I want you to open your heart to the idea that I'm just going to give you an option, and you're going to have to trust me. It's going to scare you. It's not going to be enjoyable at times, but I'm going to open the door. So not all of us get the burning bush experience like Moses. I read about it and, and prayed about it and asked God for another one. I even picked the bush in my back 11 acres. hasn't burst into flames yet. Um, no, I'm joking. I didn't do that. But the point is this. We want that. That's what we want. So starting Exodus 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, 
the priest of Midian, and he led the flocks to the far side of the wilderness and came to Hebron, or sorry, Horeb, the mountain of God. Normal day, guys. Okay? Tending the flocks, doing this a long time. Everything started out normal, and it's just about to get freaky. The second verse, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. The day just got really crazy. Moses saw that though the bush was still was on fire, it did not burn up. So verse 3 says this, so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Yeah, no kidding. Why the bush does not burn up. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. He realized what he was dealing with. It went from being a burning bush to an encounter with the Almighty. Just like that. He realized, wow, this is not just a normal day any longer. Verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave, slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a, into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I have seen the ways of the Egyptians and how they are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Up to this point, Moses is like, oh yeah, God, you see it? Oh man, this is awesome. This is so great. I'm all over this. I'm all over this. Go. And he goes, wait a second. That wasn't part of the beginning of this, was it? He was all good about hearing about the affliction and how God had seen it. And, and he was excited up to this point until he heard the part. In verse 10, when he said, I'm sending you. So verse 7 starts with this, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Verse 12, and God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. First excuse, Moses coughed up. Who am I? God, maybe you don't realize who you're dealing with. I've got a past. I've got a history. You know what? I was once a member of the ruling house of Egypt. They know who I am. I'm not just the kid no one knew about. I'm there. He also said this. You know what? It's been 40 years since I've been in Egypt. I ran away because I killed an Egyptian. Who am I? What about me? I'm not the right guy. You know what, like I said earlier, he was 80 years old. He was already past average lifespan. He wasn't the candidate. God, maybe you were supposed to light the bush on the next mountain over. This was the wrong bush. I'm the wrong guy. Who am I? But I love what he says in verse 12. I will certainly be with you. God says, you know what, I, I realize it doesn't make sense, but I'll be with you. I'll be with you. And really, the sad part is this. We should have quit the sermon right there it should have been over we should have rejoiced because god's with moses most moses should have said okay well let's go do her let's get her done but he didn't and and i think it's easy i love watching the old testament as i read through the old testament we see the children of israel rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall honestly i want honesty out of the congregation how many people have sat there and went i wouldn't do that after seeing what god's done for the children i would have been like i would have been 100 percent on board that's me. I've been there. Because you have this attitude. It's like he j he's given you manna and a pillar of fire and uh, a pillar of smoke and you, all these amazing things. And, and you don't trust him? We would probably be in the same boat. Just being honest. 
So in Romans 8.31, I want to pull this to what it applies to us now. In Romans 8.31, Paul was talking, and I think this who am I question is pretty common. And this is what I love, what it says in Romans 8.31. What then shall we say in response to these things? This is what we shall say. If God is for us, who can be against us? That was it. You know, Moses had a deck stacked against him. It wasn't going to work. But he had one card in his deck that was completely different, and that was the Almighty. I am who I am was on his side. Sad part is we try some of the same excuses today. We try to excuse ourselves by believing we're insufficient for the task. We're not capable. Maybe we're too old. Maybe we're too young. You know what? Hannah blessed me this morning. You know why? Because she got a word. She had enough guts to stand up here and say it in front of you guys. And it was a word from God. It wasn't a word from Hannah. It was a word from God. And you know, one of the best things to know why it's a word from God is whenever you listen to it, 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 it speaks to your spirit and you realize that's what it is. Let me say something. Pastor started a legacy and impact, and that is training itself out of itself. Let me say it again. Training itself out of itself. You know what? Someday I will lose my job to someone in this church. And that's awesome. Because that's how it's meant to be. We have mega churches that whenever they lose a pastor, they have to go find a pastor from somewhere else, from a college somewhere, because they're not training their people to take the helm of leadership in their own church. You want to know a person who's going to bleed for a church? It's a person that grew up in that church because they know what that church needs. It's easy for someone who's hired to, when it gets tough to just pull the cords and say, I'm done because it doesn't mean anything to me because they're not, they're not invested. You get someone like Hannah who uh, from probably about the age of 12, 11, 12 has been a part of this church. She's invested in this church. And she's got a call of ministry on her life. It's awesome. So, But anyways... We have that excuse, you know, maybe I'm insufficient for the task. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. That's true. You are insufficient for the task. I'm insufficient for the task. There's not a person in this place that's completely and utterly qualified for the task that God's going to call him to. But that's why he said, I'm with you. Because if God were to call us, then he's going to equip us. He'll never call you unless he's ready to make you capable. A lot of times we try to do it in our own strength and we fail and we go back and say, God, see, I told you it didn't work. And God said, wait a second, you never even invited me along on the drive. Insufficient without God, but with God we are sufficient. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, you can write down, don't turn to it. I've got them written down, I'm just going to blow through them real quick. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. You know what? You take a person who, who walks off the street and doesn't have hope, and you say, these are your rules. If you, can, if you can comply to this book of rules, then you're good enough to come into the church. The sad part is, that's common talk. But that's not biblical. God isn't... God doesn't call me to clean anyone. He's all about cleaning. He's all about taking care of it. All we're called to do is be honest, be open, and to love one another. We have to be bold. But with that, you know, the best part about it is this. The law kills, but the spirit gives life. Let's sow the spirit into the world because that's what's going to give life. So with that, the who am I excuse, you know what, we can have that. You know, look at the apostles. If there was anyone that could have had that excuse, who am I? It was the apostles. We got fishermen, tax collectors. We've got, we've got, I mean, we've got a couple that were like, you know what? Maybe there's a couple in there that were qualified. Paul was qualified on a physical level, but on a spiritual level, he wasn't. God had to be the spiritual qualification of Paul's life. You know what? We had people like Peter who weren't qualified spiritually or physically. I mean, these guys, yeah, they, they had had some spiritual, some spiritual schooling, but they weren't qualified. But God says, you know what, leave your nets and follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. I'll qualify you because I don't care about past. So the first one, who am I? The second one, 
what shall I say? And for that, let's read further on. Verse, four, uh, verse 13, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am sent you, sent me to you. 15, God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord your God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. And so the next one is this, what shall I say? Moses knew that uh, if he should go to the children of Israel, they were bound to be questions. There was enough of them around still to remember who he was and what his past was. What are the questions? And you know what he says, this is what you should say, this is my name, this is who I am. As a Christian, we're in the same boat, there's going to be questions. There's two things I think that are really important when we're going and speaking to the world about the love of Jesus Christ. Number one, honesty. You know what? You know who I am? I'm Jeremy Haraldson, I'm 29 years old, I'm a mechanic welder at a coal-fired power plant, and I'm a pastor at Impact Ministry. I deal with the same stuff that you deal with every day. I deal with frustrations. I deal with anger issues. I deal with the, the language. The, that's what I deal with. I'm just a normal person. But guess what? There's something very much different. It's this. I say, God, I give you my life. I'll do what you want me to do. And there's a lot of people in this room that have made that decision. And when we do that, it radically changes who we are. Yes, I am a mechanic, but guess what defines me? God. Yes, I am a pastor, but guess what defines me? God. So number one, honesty. Number two is this. You need to show them that God is love. I think there's two images of God that we need to be careful that we don't portray. We don't portray that God is the grandfather in the rocking chair that's going to give you whatever you want whenever you want it. That's not God. God is there to supply all our needs. I'm not saying that. But if we brand him as just that, then there's no fear for the consequences of our sin. But if we also brand him as a tyrannical God that's here to squish you the moment you make a mistake, we also brand the wrong image of God. God is a loving father. You know what? If my kids make a mistake, I don't come down on them and say, you know, I don't want you anymore. No, you, you, you take them in your arms and, and you, you talk to them about what they did wrong. Maybe you discipline them because what they did wrong was a disobedient act against something that you said. But you love them. You, you hug them. You tell them that you're proud of them. You know, that's the difference. That's a God that loves us when, when we do that. I'm not always perfect. There's times whenever I do lose my temper with my kids and stuff. But the point is this. God is a God of love, but also a God of justice. And so whenever we talk to people and they, we ask that question, we have that excuse, what shall I say? Be honest, number one, about you. And then be honest, number two, about your God. And be honest about how he loves them and he, he died for them. So the third Suppose they will not believe me. Suppose they will not believe me. Exodus 4.1 4, starts with this. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Two, then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff. Verse 5, this said the Lord is what you may, this is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Verse 6 says this, then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak and when he took it out, the skin was leprous and it became white as snow. Verse 7, now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Verse 8, then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, then you may believe that they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground, the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, 
I've been very eloquent. I've not been very eloquent either in the past nor since, and have spoken and have, have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and of tongue. Okay, so I'm just being honest. That would have been really cool, don't you think? I mean, you want to talk about a manifestation of the power of God. Not, not only are you t- talking to a burning bush. Let's forget the burning bush for a second here. If that isn't enough to just give you the wow factor, now all of a sudden your stick's turning into a snake. Your hand went from leprosy to no leprosy. You have, uh, well, I guess no leprosy to leprosy to no leprosy. And then you got blood turning into, or water turning into blood. Moses has all of the, yeah, he, he's set. He's set. But guess what? We just heard it. He's pulling up another excuse. So let's real quick look at that. You know, what, what about the equipping? I'm not equipped. What, what if, uh, I don't know if they'll even believe me. Now that he knows what to say, he boxed at the, the, the idea that people may even listen to him. God responded to him by equipping him with several different convincing proofs. The rod, his hand, the water. You know, he had everything at, at his fingertips. He was set. You know, but for us, some sh- hesitate to share the gospel for the same reasons. You know, what, what, sh- what do I do? What, what, should I, what should I bring forth? I, I don't have anything. I don't have anything. The fear of failure keeps us from trying. How many people in the room today have a testimony? Every person here. If you're saved, you have a testimony. You might be like, my testimony is pretty boring. My test, I, I, I wasn't like all tattooed up, about ready to go join the biggest gang in the world and get saved. You know, not all of us have Nikki Cruz's testimony. I realize that. But the point is this. Can I argue with Liz Mace's testimony? No, because it's her testimony. I can't argue with your testimony. No one can argue with your testimony. They can try, but they won't have any foundation because it's your testimony. God's equipped every single one of us with a story of salvation, and it's their story. If you don't have a story of salvation, if you don't have a testimony, it's time to get a testimony. You know what? This is the most amazing part. God wants to save you out of your test. Whatever it may be, you know, whatever, however jacked up it is or however perfect it is, God wants to save you right where you're at. He wants to give you a testimony. He wants to equip you to go out. The fear of failure keeps us from going forward, from trying. But it's just as God gave Moses the convincing proofs with the rod, the hand, and the blood, he gave us the same. Let's look at Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from the hearing of the message, and the message is heard through the words about Christ. Again, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the words about Jesus Christ. You know, talk about God, Jesus, what he did. Start building a case for Christ in their lives. Because this is it. There's, if there's one person that can save them, it's Jesus Christ. It, it, isn't, it isn't their 401k. It's not the stock market, obviously. Um, it's not the government. It's not the military strength. Salvation comes from one and one alone, and that's Jesus Christ. That's it. And so as we, the convincing proof is, is, is Christ. John 2030 says this. Jesus uh, performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That was John 20, 30 through 31. We've got life. We've got the ability to share who Jesus Christ is. We've got scripture. We've got personal testimony. We've got the ability to. And so, you know, we really don't have much uh, st- at stake when it comes to what if they don't believe me. You know, this is it. Where did I put my clicker? Anyone? There it is. 
not everyone will believe you. Being honest, it's not always going to end beautiful. I wish it did. I wish I could say every single time you share your your salvation message, every single time you share your faith, someone's going to come into the kingdom of God. I wish that were the case. It isn't the case because people have free will. We don't have to accept Jesus Christ. We get to accept Jesus Christ. Does that mean we, we, get, we get told no? We get someone that blows up in our faith and we say, you're right, you're right, I'll give up because it just isn't worth it for me. No, you get up, you dust off, and you go do it again because that's what we're called to do. So four, we talked about it. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. You know, how many people in the room today are ready to take this mic and preach a sermon right now if I were to walk up to you? Not everyone's raising their hand. Is it uncomfortable? Yes. There are times where it's very uncomfortable. It's not comfortable to stand up in front of people and bring bring the word or bring bring your thoughts. Um, Jacob Adam was writing a book about personalities. He's wrote, written one. He's on his second, correct, brother? And it's talking about personalities and how we interact with people by different personalities. And, and he's done a lot of research on personality types. And the interesting part is this. What type of personality do I have? Give me the a red. I am outspoken. I usually speak first, think later. I have no compassion. That's just my personality. It's something God's working on with me. That is. Um, but and there are there are reds in the room who who read this who read this excuse and go, I've never related with that. That just isn't me. I'm slow to speech and slow of tongue. And you're like, no. Nope. What is that? What color? Probably yellow. But they can listen really well, and they're going to be the friend you want whenever things are going wrong. This is it. Books aside, all of it aside, God needs every type of personality in his church to make it work. You may sit there and go, I wish I was a red. I wish I could go and I wish I could go up there and preach. And you know what? If all of us were preachers, it wouldn't work. Because you need people who will be who will listen, who will be there for you. So we got we got a, a theatrical production we're gonna do in 2016 on this very subject. Stay tuned. It'll be in the spring. It's gonna be awesome. But that's not what we're talking on today. So the excuse, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Verse 10 said, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant. God has to be mad by now. It's like Moses, wake up! Really? How much more do I need to do for you? Pardon your servant. Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servants. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Let's see what God says. He says, the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Okay, so maybe he's getting a little more frustrated at this point. Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Short of, short of Solomon, this is pretty much the most of equipping that I've ever seen in Scripture. Where God's saying, dude, I've got your back. I'm going to be there for you. Moses claims he is not an eloquent speaker. But God is not moved by his objections. God's like, oh, you're right. Wrong guy. Next mountain. He already knows the inability of the people he calls. Doesn't that seem interesting? He already knows the inability of the people he calls. He doesn't call Janet and go, well, I didn't know all this stuff about her. I wouldn't have done it if I did. <laughs> God's God. He knows all. God would have not said, you know what, I feel at this point in time it's Jeremy's calling in his life to take lead pastor position at Impact. Oh, never mind. I wasn't quite sure of myself. I, I, I was wrong. There was a couple things I didn't see. God 
knows our inabilities when he calls us. And this is it. The more inabilities we possess, the more ability we need from him. And the more ability you need from God, the more you're going to be like God, because it's going to be less of you. You know, the worst thing that could ever happen for the lead pastor position at Impact is Jeremy Haroldson being Jeremy Haroldson. Yeah, I think that was my dad back there. Um, He knows me better than most. The point is this, I'm a normal person and I'm a human being that deals with problems. But in this, the amazing part is this, God doesn't care about my problems, he cares about my ability to submit. My excuse would not have been I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. I would have been, it would have been this, and this is honest. I scored two on my compassion in my, in my t- uh, gifting. And that's honesty, guys. Um, ten's the high, one's the low, and by the grace of God, I made two. <laughs> I really struggle with people who, in my opinion, can't get it all together. And so I use that excuse whenever Dale asks me. It's like, God, you don't understand. I don't have a problem preaching. I'd be a good evangelist. Why don't you sign me up for that one? And uh, and God didn't listen to me because he doesn't care. He doesn't care about my inabilities. He cares about my ability to submit so that my inabilities become my strengths. So pray for me. I'm going for, I'm going for higher than two now. I will. He has the ability to make up for even our grandest shortcomings. Our God has the ability to make up for our grandest shortcomings. Again, he promised to be with Moses. Again, he promised to be with Moses. I mean, yeah, again. So what, at the end, he finally gives in. Verse 14, he says this. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were with your as if you were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Finally, God's like, I already I already have him coming because I knew you'd be a pill. I was just hoping you'd you'd shape up. But he already had him coming. And this is the greatest part about it is God has been putting up with humans for thousands of years. And he knows how we are. And he still loves us. And that's exciting. Okay, so for Christians, obviously, we talked about we do the same excuses. You know, in 1 Corinthians 2, 1. Uh, Paul says this, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence of human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Even Paul saying, I just came as Paul. It wasn't anything fancy. It was just the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he went in on on verse uh, on uh, 3 and 4. It says this, I came to you in weakness and with great fear and trembling. My pa- message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. That's it right there. That's the ticket. You want to be a, a tool for God? Realize you're inadequate and the Spirit's adequate. And finally, please send whoever else you may send. So let me ask this question. First four excuses, were they a smokescreen? Were they, were they Moses' smokescreen to finally say, God, I don't want to go? I would have told you that at the beginning, but you're God, and I can't really say that. So let's read. Let's finish this out real quick. So we know the story goes on. Moses returns to Egypt. After the the anger of the Lord kindled against him and burned against him, and and he finally said uh, in verse 13, But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. 
at that point is when, when more than the bush was burning. We had God burning at that point. He was mad because he finally said, enough, Moses, you're going. Aaron's going with you. It's time to get off the mountain. Go get rid of the sheep. Go to Egypt. You know, every excuse we give God's a smokescreen. It really is. And the smokescreen is this. I'm going to try to cover up the fact I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. How many people here, if I were to say, we're going, I'm buying all tickets, and we're going to Elitch's. Who wants to go to Elitch's with me? It's an amusement park in Denver. Okay. So there's some people who are like, my body won't do a roller coaster. Um, so if I were to say, hey, this is it, I can get everyone here, all-inclusive tickets to Cancun. Who wants to go? Okay. Some people are interested. Some people aren't interested. But most of everyone's interested. Hey, we're going to go and we're going to share our faith at the mall in Denver. Who's, who's interested? we got a couple, but the point is this. It's easy to want to go to Cancun all-inclusive on the church. It's a lot harder to want to go and, and, and share your faith with people. It, it goes against our grain. It's not comfortable. If you think it's comfortable, then that is really awesome because that means you're doing what God's called you to do. But this is it. Any excuse we use is a smokescreen. We'd really rather God use someone else. It's easier. It's more comfortable. Church is comfortable when I can come sit in my seat. I get out at 11.30, 11.45. I can go home and everything's good. It's a lot less comfortable when God calls me out of that and says, you know what? It's time to go and do something different. If the truth were to be known, we probably really don't want to do what God has called us to do. If it was, and, and I'm, I'm speaking to myself, this is where God showed me if every one of us were passionately sharing our faith, we couldn't build a big enough church quick enough. Let me say it again. If every one of us was passionately sharing our faith, we couldn't build a big enough church quick enough. We would change our remodel plans, and we'd knock that back wall out before we ever looked at doing a kitchen because it wouldn't matter about a kitchen because we wouldn't have enough seats to sit, seat everyone. We would be worrying about two services because we would have to do two services. And I'm not, I'm not coming down on you. I'm coming down on me. I'm coming down on us. This is us. All of us are in this boat. All of us deal with this. Because guess what? It's more comfortable to talk about the Instapot or whatever it is than it is to talk about our faith with Jesus Christ. What's it called? Instapot. Thank you. Do go look at it. It's cool. There's even a blog that was started. Go look it up, too. That's cool, too. But guys, God gets angry when we say no. When we're talking about a God of, of grace and a God of love, God is a God of grace and a God of love, but sometimes love means tough love. Maybe sometimes love, you know, as a parent, you've done this. There's sometimes you've done things where if you were to ask your kid, does your parent love you? They'd be like, no. I don't know why taking the keys Friday night's loving me. But whenever you do that, you know that what's best for your kid. You know what's best for your child because you know that the decisions they've made is leading them down a path they shouldn't go. And so we're going to take those keys Friday night. And you can spend, we'll do a movie night as a family. And, and you got a forked off teenager sitting on the couch next to you. But the point is this, it's because you love them. It's because you care. Tough love sometimes is a love driven by a form of anger, a, a righteous anger. You know what? Whenever we tell God no, there is going to be a fueling of his anger. When we say we're a Christian, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian. When we claim Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can't claim Christ without claiming the calling. Listen, guys, we can't claim Christ without claiming the calling. God has called you. It's time to walk in the calling. 
and it's time to ask for forgiveness because this is it. Maybe God has been trying to needle us for a long time to go into this next step. And you know what? We've given excuse upon excuse. We could write another five lines up there of what we say to God whenever he goes and tells us that. I don't want to offend. You know what? I'm not a good enough friend yet. You know what? Those are, those are in, at times legitimate, but the point is this. If God's telling you to go, they're not legitimate anymore. At that point, they're only excuses. We've been making excuses. It's time to repent. We know the rest of the story with Moses. He answered the call, went to Egypt. With the help of God, he delivered over a million children of Israel out of Egypt. He, he, he ri- literally riddled Egypt in the process, God did, through plagues and through uh, the, the killing of the firstborn and then ultimately the uh, annihilation of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. We realized that uh, there was a massive power swing because of this exodus. And it was all because an 80-year-old guy said, you know what, no more excuses, I'm going. But what about us? What's the rest of our story? What's the rest of your story? Let me tell you my story. I said yes. Not comfortable. Not exactly what I had thought I was going to do someday. It wasn't on my agenda or my radar, full-time ministry. That wasn't it. But God said, I'm calling you, and you're going to go. And I gave him excuses. Because it's not comfortable, guys. It's not always enjoyable. Is it rewarding? Yes, it is rewarding. But it's not always what we think it should be. But what's yours? Personally, right now, every single one of you, I don't care where you're at, because I still, even though I said yes, I still have the what ifs that I'm having to work out. Every one of us have those. What's next? Shall we heed the call to preach the gospel to the lost like we read in the first in Mark 16, 15, and 16? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation. You know, are we heeding that call? Or shall we make excuses? And you know what? One day we will suffer judgment for that. If there is a biggest fear in my life, it's this. Someday having to look at God or look at someone I knew and know that I never said it. Only time will tell. I think that's okay. As we, ch- as, uh, with a challenge, um, know this. If you come to impact and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, there's someone in this place that wants to pray with you. There's many people in this place that want to pray with you. But this is it. The person sitting next to you right now, they'd like to pray with you. I'd like to pray with you. Pastor Casey or Pastor Jody, uh, David, there's many in this room that are ready and willing to meet you in your place. So don't leave this place without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. With that being said, I'm not going to give altar call today because I'm more concerned about the rest of us right now. And that is this, what's your calling? What's your calling? That can have a lot of different dimensions to it. Every person in this room, if you if you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your calling is to tell the world about Jesus. That's it. Everyone, no exceptions. God didn't sit there and give the great commission and say, by the way, it only applies to people that were born in odd months on even days. Everyone else is exempt. It's just those people. Sorry, you're kind of messed up if that was how you came out. No, that's not it. God said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. If, if you profess me, go tell that's it. No exceptions. God doesn't make you wait. God doesn't make us go into all the world. God doesn't make us go into our neighborhood. God doesn't make us go into our workplace. He just asks us to. 